Luminaire Institute presents Health Matters. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our very own, our well known, and uh, our friend, our brother, Sheikh Mu'iz Bukhari, to speak next here at Health Matters. Just to give you a formal introduction, uh, he, has a he had a passion for Islam from childhood, and because of that, he completed his memoriz memorization of the Noble Quran at the age of 14. And then he went on to spend 10 years specializing in the fields of classical Arabic, Islamic jurisprudence, ahadith, and other Islamic sciences at the International Islamic Institute of Sri Lanka. Sheikh Mu'iz Bukhari is also the founder and a director of Lumina Institute and the director of Lumina Institute's parent, TDR Network. So without further ado, to give us spiritual advice on mental and physical health, bring my call upon Sheikh Mu'iz Bukhari. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, I think everyone has been seated for some time. I think it's best that we get our blood circulating, inshallah. So can I please ask you all to stand for a minute, please? Everybody. Now I have a request to make of all of you. I want every single one of you to make a donation. Oh, I can see the wallets are going in. I can see the handbags are, you know, going in. You know what this donation is? According to the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Smiling at your brother, smiling at your sister is a charity. So I want you all to look at one another and smile, please. Look at one another and smile. It's charity. You're not spending anything. I want to see some teeth, please. Okay? Jazakumullah khair. Everybody can sit down. May Allah, may Allah and His angels love you. Ameen. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. وأصلي وأسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل صلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد. All praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah سبحانه وتعالى who is no doubt our Creator, Sustainer, Nourisher, Protector and Curer. We ask Him سبحانه وتعالى to shower His choicest of blessings and salutations. Upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, his family members, his companions, and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. Inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to start off by talking about two very important things, and that's obviously the theme of uh, today's event. Health versus well-being. Let me start off by defining health. Health is you know, basically when an organ or a limb is healthy, functions well, and has no significant problems or issues. And we have to bear in mind this point that health is a great, great favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is amazing hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And please remember salawat when I mention his beautiful name. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said that he who attains the morning whilst he is healthy in body, secure in dwelling, in the sense he has a place to dwell, shelter, and possessing his daily um, sustenance, his day's sustenance, then it is as if the worldly life has been fully granted unto him. And the hadith has been recorded in the book of Imam Tirmidhi and Imam Ibn Majah. So we have established that health is a very, very great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the other hand, well-being, otherwise it's known in the Arabic language as afia, is at times usually used interchangeably with health. However, in Islam, well-being is something more general in meaning. It's more general. It can refer to physical and mental health. It can refer to financial success. It can re refer to spiritual righteousness. It can refer to prosperity and salvation in Al-Akhirah as well. Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, the famous scholar from the seventh century, he states in his famous book known as Zadul Ma'ad, an amazing read, I recommend you all, if you can get the translation of the book, please do read it. Amazing book. He states, Health and well-being are amongst Allah's greatest favors and most bountiful gifts unto his servants, unto his slaves. And then he goes on to say, Rather, absolute well-being is unconditionally the greatest favor. Thus, it is a right upon the individual who has been granted a portion of well-being to preserve it and to protect it from all harm. 
My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, having all of this in mind, I want you all, including myself, that we take a moment to acknowledge the blessings of our Maker subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all of us. Rasulullah sallallahu is reported to have said, Two favors that many do not take advantage of are health and time. Two favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two boons, two blessings. You know, there's a famous scholar by the name Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah. One night, he spent the entire night contemplating on one verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what that verse was? وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا that if you were to try and count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you were to try and list down the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would not be able to encompass all of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, his students, they asked him, Sheikh, I mean, you spent the entire night contemplating on this one verse, just one verse. He said, why not? I was thinking of the number of blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with, the fact that I'm healthy. The fact that I have a roof over my head, the fact that I have food over my table, and there are a number of bless blessings that you and I, we take for granted. I've said this in the past, but there's no harm in repeating it. The other day, there was a student of mine who came up to me and told me about a condition that his wife is going through. She's going through this condition where, I'm not a doctor, but then I know a few of the terms, renal failure, basically. Her kidneys are failing. Her kidneys are failing, and because of this, she has to go through the process known as dialysis. It's, it's not an easy process. It's a costly, cumbersome process. It's a process that your kidneys are doing for you within your body without you even knowing it. And we take it for granted. So basically her issue is she's finding it difficult to relieve herself. In the sense when she goes to relieve herself, she has this burning, excruciating pain that she feels. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, let me point you out to this blessing now. We take it for granted. We go, we relieve ourselves, and we are out. We don't think twice in regard to that blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that we can relieve ourselves in ease. I mean, all of you would attest, I mean, you're back from a long journey, and, and you know, you really want to use the toilet, and when, then, when you get the opportunity to go, you feel like, ah, oh, I'm like so relieved now. It's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a huge blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sure if I were to give you all papers and pens now to list down blessings that you and you're enjoying in your lives, most of us would miss this blessing. Why? Because we have taken it for granted. Likewise, there are a number of blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. And from these blessings is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you good health. If he has given you good health, it is a huge bounty and blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the hadith is in the book of Imam At-Tirmidhi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said that indeed the, the first of Allah's favors, the first of Allah's blessings that an individual will be questioned on the day of Qiyamah is did we not make your body healthy and did we not give you cool water to drink? The first of the questions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask an individual will be in regard to that individual's health. You know, at times we take the day of Qiyamah very lightly. The fact that doomsday is around the corner, we take it lightly. We take the questioning lightly. We take the fact that we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question us, but we take it lightly. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah Azza wa Jal states in the Noble Quran in regard to the day of Qiyamah, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ It will be a day when an individual will run away from his own brother, from his own sister, from his own siblings. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ He'll run away from his father, he'll run away from his mother. He'll run away from his spouse. He'll run away from his children. It's in this world that we call them honey, bunny, darling, and all of that. And the Qiyamah, that won't matter, we'll run away from one another. Why? Because in the day of Qiyamah, on the day of judgment, we will, we'll be looking at others to blame others, to secure others' good deeds. It will be such a horrifying day. According to the description given to us by the Prophet ﷺ, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, it will be a day when all of mankind will be gathered. How many human beings have we got on planet Earth currently? 
Is everybody sleeping? How many human beings? 100,000? 7 billion human beings, yes? Do you think that the day of Qiyamah is just going to consist of 7 billion human beings? No. From our father Adam alayhi salatu wasalam until the last human being to set foot on the face of this earth. All of mankind, we are all going to be gathered on that day. And according to the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are all going to be naked and uncircumcised. And do you think on that day, just because we're naked, we're going to go around, hoo hoo, you're naked, you're naked. We're not going to be doing any of that on that day. Aisha radiallahu anha had that concern. And she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, we're all going to be naked on that day. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told her, that will be the least of your concerns on that day. That will be the least of your worries on that day. It will be such a horrifying day. According to the, another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the sun will be brought down to the distance termed in the Arabic language as one meal. And I'm not talking about a happy meal here. One meal in the Arabic language can be defined as one mile, which is a little more than a kilometer. Or, the other definition is even more scarier, the stick that is used to apply surma to that distance. Now, I know some of the geniuses in the crowd might be thinking that, you know what, we're like light years away from the sun, or miles and miles away from the sun, okay? And we have studied that the earth has been strategically placed in such a way that if we were to budge even a little bit from the, you know, the orbital track, if we were to move closer to the sun, we would all be, we would all be burned to ashes. And if we would, were to move away from the sun, we would all freeze and become popsicles. How on earth would the sun be brought down to the distance equivalent to one mile, and let alone one mile to the distance equivalent to the stick that you apply surma with? Well, this is the thing, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created that sun. It is Allah azza wa jal. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. There is no power, no might except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal is so powerful. And in Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of everything, of anything basically. Allah Azza wa Jal, if He wills, He will bring the sun. And He will will that you will not be burnt to ashes and that you will not melt away into nothing. But instead, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to suffer on that day, you will suffer due to your sins. It will be a day when there will be no shade other than the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all His shade on that horrifying day. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease our affairs on that day. Moving on. The preservation of one's health, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, is an Islamic obligation. Rasulullah is reported to have said, La darara wa la dirar. In the sense, no harm may be inflicted on oneself or on others. In another narration, the Prophet وسلم, is reported to have said, Whoever throws himself or herself off a mountain, thereby killing himself, will be in hell falling off a mountain, abiding in it permanently for that particular sin. I mean, we have no right whatsoever to take our lives. And the hadith goes on. If that individual were to consume poison, that individual will continue to consume poison in hell due to that sin that that individual committed. On the other hand, if that individual were to use a sharp blade and perhaps stab himself or herself in the abdomen, in the they will be in hell doing the same thing eternally for infinity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. The hadith is recorded in the book of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. So from this we clearly understand that looking after ourselves, looking after our health, the preservation of our health is an Islamic obligation. Before I move further, there's some important content that I would like to touch on. There's the importance of striking a balance between one's spiritual and physical needs. This event is all about talking about health and we understand the importance of preserving our health and we have methodologies to preserve our health and all of this is related to our bodies but likewise just as how we're giving importance to our bodies we need to give importance to our spiritual souls you know why our bodies our biological makeup basically consists of two important elements there are other elements as well the two elements that i'm going to focus on is number one our bodies and number two our souls now as you all know our bodies have been created from elements that have been taken from this earth. 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Noble Quran, Minha khalaqnakum wa fiha nu'idukum wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. Thereof of the earth we created you, and into it we shall return you, and from it we shall bring you out once again. So we have been created from elements that are from this earth, from this dunya, all right? So the body has been created from elements that are connected to this earth. On the other hand, as you all know, our souls have been created from matters that are related to al-akhirah. And that's why, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, our bodies keep yearning for this world, whilst our souls, on the other hand, keep yearning for al-akhirah, the abode of the hereafter. And just as how we take so much of importance in terms of nourishing our bodies and feeding our bodies with that which is from this world, you need to give importance to nourish your souls spiritually with matters that are connected to the realm of the hereafter. And that's why it's so important that you give importance to salah, to the five times daily salah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed upon all of us in terms of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in terms of reading the Quran. These are all important sources of nourishment for the soul. Because if you don't nourish your soul, there's this other element as well known as nafs. Now this element is a scary element. This element, if you do not nourish your soul enough, your nafs is going to overpower your soul. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states the statement of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam in the Quran, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِسُوءٍ That, you know, I am not free of my soul. إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِسُوءٍ Indeed, the nafs, it keeps inclining towards that which is evil. You know, there is a story where a grandfather, he once looked at his grandchild and he was telling him about the story of two wolves. He was telling him that there are two wolves in every single individual, a good wolf and an evil wolf, and there is a constant battle between these two wolves. There are two wolves inside each individual. This is a story, a metaphorical story. There's a lesson behind it. Two wolves, and there is this constant battle between these two wolves, the good wolf and the evil wolf. Whilst he was telling this to the grandchild, the grandchild looked at the grandfather and asked the grandfather, so eventually, which wolf wins the battle, granddad? The grandfather looked at the boy and said very calmly, well, son, the wolf that you feed, the wolf that you feed will eventually win the battle. If you feed the good wolf, the good wolf will win the battle. If you feed the evil wolf, then the evil wolf will win the battle. Now we can look at it from an Islamic context as well. We have the, we have the soul, the ruh, and then the nafs. Like I said, the ruh keeps yearning for the hereafter. But on the other hand, the nafs, which is inclined towards evil, if you feed that evil thing, it is going to overcome and overpower your soul. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to nourish our souls. So it's of utmost importance that we strike a balance between our spiritual and physical needs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He commands us to lower our gazes. We are supposed to lower our gazes. We are supposed to establish our prayer on time. And all of these elements are closely connected to our spirituality. If you lower your gaze, I mean today we're talking about pornography. In terms of pornography, as you all know, if you talk about it from a scientific point of view, it's an addiction. It's an addiction where researchers are stating even worse than cocaine and other drugs. It's so addictive. The nature of pornography is that it's so addictive. Uh, I mean, obviously, you, you would have to have a dedicated workshop for it to explain the evil consequences of pornography, but it's so addictive. It releases this neurotransmitter known as dopamine, the, the feel-good neurotransmitter. And we get so used to it that we need more and more content to keep fueling that that desire for that drug because we want to feel good all the time and the fact that there is so much of content out there and as you all know people who are addicted they're so addicted to the, the amount of content out there that it's very difficult for that individual to be satisfied sexually because of the content that individual is being exposed to it starts off with softcore porn and then it ends up in something like uh, uh, sexual relations between animals and whatnot. It keeps aggravating by the day. It's such a horrifying epidemic. Allah says in the Quran, lower your gaze. Problem sorted. On the other hand, let's talk about salah. 
Allah says, establish your five daily salawat. Sometimes we look at it only from a spiritual angle. If you look at it from a programming angle, five daily salawat, it basically programs us. It rewires our brains, our minds in terms of how we look at things. The discipline that we are taught in salah, time management that we are taught in salah, leadership skills that we are taught in salah, these are all amazing things. The fact that your prayers have been established at appointed times. Like say for example, Dhuhr at 12.16, Maghrib at perhaps 7.6 or Isha at 7.6. And then you have the Mu'addin who stands precisely by the clock and he calls the Adhan out at 12.16 teaching us time management and the value of time. These are all amazing lessons in terms of programming our lives to declutter our lives, de-stress our lives. It is of utmost importance that we strike a balance between our spiritual and physical needs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to do so. Mo moving on very swiftly, I'm going to talk about the concept of seeking treatment now. Before I go into certain treatments that have been taught to us by the Prophet wasallam, I want to establish a principle. And the, and the principle is that we need to first identify the true healer. When talking about medical treatments, we need to first identify the true healer. The sick should seek treatment for their sicknesses and at the same time they should remember that the true healer is which doctor? Which professor? The true healer is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The true healer is none other than Allah Azza wa Jal. As he states in the Noble Quran, الَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِهِينَ وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُتْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينَ وَإِذَا مَرِضْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ وَالَّذِي يُمِيتُنِي ثُمَّ يُحْيِينَ it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created me and then who is guiding me. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who feeds me and it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who provides me to drink. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when I fall ill, he cures me and it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will cause me to die and then give me life again. It is all Allah azza wa jal. But we also need to understand just as how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained sickness Allah also has ordained the cure for it. It is all part of the divine destiny of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah is reported to have said, medication is part of qadr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefits whom he wills with whatever he wills. Medication, seeking medication is part of qadr. In the sense, part of the divine destiny. We as believers, what do we believe in? We believe in how many articles of faith? How many articles of faith? Mu'minun, ya mu'minun, how many articles of faith? Six articles of faith, yes? Al-imanu billah, al-imanu an tu'mina billah wa malaika wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawm al-akhir wa bil qadr. It is to believe in Allah, right? To believe in the books of Allah, to believe in his angels, to believe in his messengers, to believe in the day of qiyamah, that doomsday is on its way. And to believe in divine destiny, the fact that every single thing has been, de has been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you know what? Many of us have misconceptions, strong misconceptions in regard to this particular principle, in regard to this particular article of faith, in regard to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because obviously it's something that our minds find very difficult to fathom. It's very difficult to conceive. Because just as Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is reported to have said, the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like an ocean that has no coast to it. And the only way an individual can traverse across that ocean is on the ship of legislation. In the sense, the legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In terms of the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that everything has been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then again, there are two extremes in regard to this particular principle. There have been many a group that has gone astray because of their misconceptions and wrong beliefs in regard to Qadr. There's one group, for example, that, you know, they believed that everything has been decreed by God. Everything has been decreed by God. And we have no free will whatsoever. But this is a very problematic belief. Because according to them, that individual can go rob a bank. That individual can go rape a woman. And he would say, you know what, I'm a puppet. And I'm being pulled by strings. I have no free, free will. It was decreed that I should rob the bank. And here you are, I'm robbing the bank. It was decreed that... 
I was supposed to rape a woman and here I have done that. I cannot be held accountable. This is one group and they went astray. The other group, they took free will to another level. They negated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely from the equation. They said that we have so much of free will that until we make a choice or a decision, God does not know about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not know about it. Now we, the Muslimun, as usual, we are a nation that is just and balanced. We always take the path of moderation according to the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We never go to the two extremes because the two extremes are destructive. We always seek for the middle ground right in the middle. So we follow the middle opinion which is everything has been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but then again we also have free will. The choice is ours. You come to a junction where you have the path that leads to goodness and the path that leads to evil. That choice is yours. That choice is yours and you make that choice. But in terms of what choice that you're about to make, that is in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of us, we confuse the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the decree of Allah azza wa jal. If you choose the path of goodness, then your destiny will unravel itself according to that particular path. If you take the path towards evil, then your destiny will unravel itself accordingly that way. But your choice there, Allah knows about it. Because obviously, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is infinite. There's no limit to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows everything. There's nothing hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not a tiny black ant crosses a dark rock or a dark surface in the middle of the night, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears the footsteps of that ant and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about that ant. There's nothing hidden from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moving on to the decree, there's one final point in that regard. And this is a beautiful statement by Umar radiallahu an. Once Umar radiallahu an and a few of the companions, they went on an expedition, on a campaign to Sham, to Sham, which consisted at that time of Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, and uh, Jordan. They were on their way there. And whilst they had made their way, you know, halfway through the journey, they get news that there is this epidemic, there is this plague that has hit Sham. And they were asking Umar radiallahu anhu as in regard to what should be done. Umar radiallahu anhu immediately consulted a few of the senior companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he decided to turn the expedition back. Now, there was Abu Ubaidah ibn, ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu, if I'm not mistaken, who went to Umar radiallahu anhu and he asked him, Ya Umar, are you running away from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Listen to me attentively. Are you running away from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Basically, the point that he was making is that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that you will be afflicted by the plague, you will be afflicted whether you enter Syria or not. Are you running away from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Umar radiallahu an listened to him and obviously Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu an, another senior companion, he looked at him and he educated him in, some, in, in regard to something very important. And you know what he said? Profound words. He said, I'm running away from the decree of Allah towards the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Apply your minds and you'll get the point. It's a fine, delicate point. I'm running away from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the sense, the fact that I've decided to turn the expedition back is the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has decreed that I should turn it back and that's why I'm turning the expedition back. Okay? And then Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu was not privy to that conversation. He makes his way and he informs Umar radiallahu anhu and Abu, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu anhu that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that if you are outside a city or a village that has been afflicted with a plague or an epidemic, then do not enter that city, do not enter that village or that vicinity. On the other hand, if you are within the confines of a village or a locality that has been hit with an, with an epidemic or a plague, then do not leave the city with that contagious disease. Amazing instructions from the Prophet ﷺ. So no sooner Umar heard that, he thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he turned the expedition back. So from this you understand a few important points in regard to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That everything has been decreed and we have been given free will, a choice to make between good and evil. This has been given to us and this is the difference between us and animals. Animals don't have free will. They don't have a choice to make basically. They behave like animals but we on the other hand we have this free will where we make the choice between that which is good and that which is evil. Moving on in terms of medications my dear brothers and sisters in Islam 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa is reported to have said, Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send down a sickness except that he has sent down a medication for it. Known to those who know it and not known to others except for one thing. And what is that? Death. There's no cure for death. Allah states in the Quran, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ That every soul shall inevitably taste death. You know, those who these days, like I said earlier, consider themselves intellectuals and geniuses, they question the, the very existence of God. And they have all kinds of theories that they come up with. They come up with all these theories, they question the existence of God, and they question almost everyone's belief systems, and they consider themselves to be above others. There is one thing that they will not question or talk about, and that is this matter, death. No one has anything to say about it because every single person has to experience it and no one can escape it. As Allah says in the Noble Quran, Wherever you are, death will reach you. Even if you fortify yourself within a lofty tower and think that the angel of death will not reach you, the angel of death will most definitely reach you at the appointed time because that is the task, that is the duty that he has been assigned to do. This is one thing that no one escapes from. No one. You can be the richest person on the face of this earth, but you cannot escape death. And no one has come back from the, death, from the dead in reality to, t to tell people about what happens on the other side. No one knows. So it's a game of probability here that you're playing with that if you were to pass away not believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then the risk is obviously you're going to end up in a life that lasts forever and ever, a life of infinity in gloom and sadness and in despair and in punishment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save, save us all and that's not a risk that we want to take. So coming back to medications now, I want to quickly focus on two important medications from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Primarily, the first, which is a very important medication, that is honey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Noble Quran in regard to honey, ثُمَّ كُلِي مِن كُلِّ الثَّمَرَاتِ فَاسْلُكِي سُبُلَ رَبِّكِ ذُلُلَا يَخْرُجُ مِن بُطُونِهَا شَرَابٌ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهُ فِيهِ شِفَاءٌ لِلنَّاسِ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةً لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah says, يَخْرُجُ مِن بُطُونِهَا شَرَابٌ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهُ And that emerges from their bellies a drink, the bellies of the bees, a drink wearing in colors in which there is healing for people. Indeed, in that is a sign for people who give thought. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, many, many researchers attest that honey is extremely effective in reducing the period of diarrhea because of its germ-killing properties. There was this germ specialist and researcher by the name Dr. Sackett in the Colorado uh, agricultural college who carried out a few tests. He put germs that cause various diseases in dishes with pure honey and he found out that all the germs died including the germs that cause typhus, the typhoid fever. So it's so powerful in terms of its germ killing properties. And we have a hadith where the Prophet uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri he mentions that a man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, my brother is suffering from diarrhea. My brother is suffering from diarrhea. Rasulullah immediately instructed him to tell his brother to consume some honey. So the man goes and tells his brother that. The brother consumes. The, the, the other man, the, the patient, consumes honey. And there was no result. So this man comes back to the Prophet وسلم, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, my brother is still sick. Rasulullah instructs him again, go give him honey. And this happens three times, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Until finally, the third time, the Prophet وسلم, he looked at this man and said, Allah is most definitely stating the truth, but your brother's stomach is lying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating the truth in the Quran, but your brother's stomach is lying, go give him honey. And the fourth time after honey was given, he recovered with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Apart from that, honey is also considered a strong antibiotic. The effects of honey as a remedy have been researched in the past and in modern studies. 
And it has been found to work as an antibiotic when used topically as, an, as a topical ointment on wounds and burns. You need to understand something in regard to the way bees work. They say busy as a bee. The way bees make honey, the bees work hard to collect nectar and they keep away from filth. It's all pure stuff that comes out from the bee. It has a strict code that it follows to produce the honey that it produces. And honey is composed of 19 substances, vital, integral, and beneficial to the human body. And therefore, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the bee deserves to be likened to the sincere believer. Rasulullah is reported to have said, the likeness of the believer is that of the bee. It only eats that which is good and it only produces that which is good. Because obviously a believer is an individual who only consumes that which is good. He only consumes that which is pure. In another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi is reported to have said, Inna Allah tayyib, wa la yaqbalu illa tayyiba. Indeed, Allah is pure, Allah is good, and He does not accept except that which is good. And He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to read the ayah, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu kulu min tayyibati ma razaqnaakum. O you who have brought in iman, consume from that which is good, from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided you of. In terms of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided you, consume that which is good. Allahu Akbar. And then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to mention in that same narration, in regard to a man who had traveled far, he's disheveled, he's bedraggled, he's dusty, okay? And he raises his hands whilst matu'amuhu haram, wa mashrabuhu haram, wa malbasuhu haram, wa gudhiya bil haram. He raises his hands, but his food is all from haram sources, from forbidden sources, impure stuff. haram. His clothing is from impure sources. haram. He has been basically nourished by that which is haram, that which is impure, that which is forbidden. And he raises his hands and he makes dua unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah mentions in that narration, How can his duas be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because he has been nourished by that which is haram. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to stick to that which is halal and pure. I mean, moving on to the next very important medication from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that is milk. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, whoever is given milk to drink, let him say, O Allah, bless it for us and give us more of it, for there is nothing that takes the place of both food and drink except milk. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he quotes from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and he says, the most beloved of drinks to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was milk. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, modern science states that milk is the only food that contains all the basic substances needed by the human body. Milk contains sugar, milk contains fats, milk contains minerals, milk contains iron, milk contains sodium, and milk contains vitamins A, B, and C. Rasulullah is reported to have said, Allah does not create any disease, but he also creates the remedy for it. You should drink cow's milk, for it eats from all plants. Words of the Prophet and at the end of the day, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَىٰ He does not speak out of his own desires. What he speaks is divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the maker who created you and I, all of us. And at this point, I would like to highlight Cow's milk may take the place of mother's milk in cases where the mother is unable to feed the child herself, but we must confirm and we must say very strongly that there is no comparison at all between the two as mother's milk provides the perfect nutrition for the infant, just as how Professor Kamaldin highlighted as well. Moving on, there are other medications from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which I'm not going to go into, but I'll just highlight them out for you, such as musk, such as black seed. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said in regard to black seed, in it is a healing for every disease that can be treated with it, except assam, except death. And then vinegar, olive oil, figs, cupping, henna, ginger, Rayhan, in the sense certain sweet-smelling sweet -smelling plants. These are all medications from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa 
But as I'm coming close to the end of my talk, there's something that I want to focus on, and with that I'll conclude, inshallah ta'ala. And this is in regard to spiritual healing, because after all, I'm supposed to be touching on the spiritual aspects of health and healing. And this is known as ruqya in the Arabic language. Ruqya, spiritual healing. And this is to use the Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to heal our sicknesses and our diseases. In terms of ruqya, very swiftly, Imam Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, a famous scholar who wrote the famous commentary in regard to the book of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, known as Fath al-Bari, he states that there is a consensus, a consensus amidst the ulama, amidst the scholars, that ruqya is permissible, listen to me attentively, is permissible when it satisfies three conditions. And these three conditions, number one, it should be with Allah's words or using His names and attributes. In the sense, whatever ruqya is done, it should be through the Quran. Not through numbers, not through lemons and limes, not through eggs, not through any of all of that, not through talismans, not through amulets. It should be through the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, i.e. the Qur'an, or using the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the sense invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His names and attributes. That's condition number one. Condition number two, it should be in Arabic, the ruqya, the spiritual healing should be in Arabic, or of an intelligible meaning. In the sense, you can't have symbols, you can't have numbers. At times, you know, I have to highlight this and I have to mention this. You see people going to certain individuals and you see them paying a lot of money to those individuals. And those individuals, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, they're fraudsters, they're charlatans. They give you bottles, they give you copper plates with numbers. You see, when you study about the history of magic, ancient history of magic goes back to Egypt. And Egypt, you get hieroglyphics, you get all these symbols, all these numbers. That's where all this comes from. You don't see any of this in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the lives of the Sahaba ridwan lahi ta'ala alayhi majma'in. None of them hung up bottles. None of them, you know, wrote things on eggs. There are some individuals they have been told to buy a hundred eggs and break those eggs. Allahu Akbar, you can make hundred omelets with those eggs. What a waste. Hundred eggs. Let me tell you something. I was in a country where there is this so-called spiritual healer. And nowadays, the spiritual heal healers are also becoming very modern and they're into technology and whatnot. So basically, this healer, there was this person who was, you know, afflicted, jinn possession, basically. So this person went to this healer and told the healer, so-called, quote-unquote, healer, about the, the situation, about the problem. The healer said, okay, fine, I can treat you. I can treat you, but my payment is one digital printer. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. One, my payment is one digital printer. Okay. And he said for the, for the cure, to cure you, I need another digital printer as well. So basically two digital printers. And he said after the procedure is done, that printer, you will not be able to use it because I'm going to use it to cure you of the gin. So that printer will also not be able to be used. So you'd have to give me both the printers. I'll dispose of that printer. I know how to dispose of it. And then he told this person, you need to bring me 100 A4 sheets of paper. 100 A4 sheets of paper. And he said, you come on this particular date and I'll tell you what to do. He came on the particular date, the appointed date, and he said, look, this is the picture of the devil that has possessed you. He had basically Googled devil. If you Google devil, you get all kinds of pictures. He showed him a picture and he said, this is the picture of the devil, the jinn that has possessed you. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out 100 pictures. That's what he wanted the papers for. I'm going to print out 100 pictures of the face of this devil. And what I want you to do is sit by the beach and I want you to burn every single paper. For every single paper that you burn, you're burning a mark, a mark, a scar on the face of the jinn that has possessed you. And the person did it. The person did all of what he said. He bought the two printers, he bought the papers, did all this, and finally, after doing all of that, the jinn didn't go anywhere, he asks now, is it right in regard to what he had done? Allahu Akbar, from where did this come from? From where did the printers come from? From where did the papers come from? And these days people say all kinds of things. They ask you to slaughter animals, they ask you to boil those animals in the middle of your house, they ask you to bathe in the broth of those animals, they ask you to sprinkle the water of the of that broth all over the house, you're attracting more jinnat. You're dirtying your house, you're 
contaminating your house. The jinn love dirty places. That's where they're going to come in. And you're attracting, you're basically making your house a magnet for the jinn. And this individual too had paid this person so much of money. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, always go back to the teachings of the Prophet wasallam. As you can see, the conditions are very clear. It should be with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his names and attributes. Number two, it should be in Arabic or an intelligible meaning. In the sense, you can't have mumbo jumbo. You can't have all kinds of other wordings. It should be from the Quran. It should be in Arabic or it should be in something that you can understand. In the sense, this person is making dua, praying unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third condition is that it must be believed that even the ruqya that is done, the spiritual healing, does not have an independent power of its own. Rather, it is dependent on the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the sense, its power comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the spiritual healing, the power comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it does not have its own independent power. If you have any questions in this regard, please don't hesitate to text them in and I'll address them. These days, many people have questions. Many people don't know where to go. They have jinn possession problems. And at times, most of the time, the jinn possession issues are psychological issues. They hear creaking at night. They hear rasping on their windows at night. It's basically a branch rasping across the window. It's perhaps a loose uh, flowboard that's creaking. At times, it's never the jinn. We at times think that everything is the jinn. At times, you might even think that the four seats or five seats here that we have kept are for special jinnath. VIP jinnat that have come and they're listening. They, they might be listening because the jinn do attend talks. The jinn do attend seminars. The jinn do attend lectures. As you all know, it's not something that we deny because there is a complete chapter in the Quran that talks about the jinn. There are many ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that talk about the jinn. But like I mentioned that there are misconceptions in regard to Qadr, there are many misconceptions in regard to the jinn. People think that for example, there are many people who claim to say, you know what, I can see the jinn there. And if I were to say, for example, I can see a jinn seated on that chair there. And if none of you can see the jinn, then I am lying. Wallahi, I am lying. Because the jinn, in their true form, in their true form, no one can see them. Remember this principle. This is something many people are not aware of. If the jinn is in their true form, no one can see them. Allah states in the Quran that the jinn, Shaitan and his tribe, they see you from a place where you cannot see them. You cannot see the jinn if they're in their true form. On the other hand, you must also know that the jinn, they shape shift and they transform. They can take on different forms. This is all part of the discussion under Ruqya. They can take on different forms. Like say, for example, they can come in the guise of a human being. You never know, the sister next to you might be a jinn. The brother next to you might be a jinn in the guise of a human being. They can shape shift, they can transform. And not just human beings, they can even come in the form of animals. Sometimes you see a cat from nowhere, that could be a jinn. They like to take on the form of black animals, black cats, black dogs, black snakes. All this is from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa But remember this principle. The minute they shape shift, the minute they transform, like say for example, if a jinn wanted to come here, and the jinn shapeshifts or transforms into a human being, then we can all see that jinn. Obviously, we won't be able to identify that jinn as a jinn unless it does some funny things like flying and whatnot. But apart from that, we will all be able to see the jinn. Not just one person. So if someone complains, I'm seeing things, that person is hallucinating. There's a term for it in the medicinal field. It's something to do with the brain of that individual and the mind of that individual. The mind is playing tricks on you. It's nothing to do with the jinn. There are many people who come to me for counseling, many jinn problems, and most of the time, 90% of the time, it's psychological issues. Nothing to do with jinn in reality. I mean, we do ruqya and we can easily identify there's nothing at all to do with the jinn. It's stress, it's perhaps depression, it's perhaps hallucination, it's perhaps side effects of certain drugs. All of these issues, it's medicinal issues and needs to be addressed from a medicinal perspective. You need to go to perhaps a counselor, you need to go to a psychologist, and you need to get these issues addressed. But on the other hand, if you go to a fraudster, and if seriously you're suffering from hallucinations, and if this fraudster identifies that, he is going to make a buck or two out of you. He's going to make, you might be thinking that you are actually hallucinating, he'll convert that into a fancy jinn story. He'll say that this jinn has been haunting you for generations. There's so much of wealth hidden here, hidden there, and all kinds of fancy stories to wind you up into that. So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, don't fall prey to all these things. 
Our deen is extremely clear. Our deen is extremely lucid. Our deen is based on the Quran, the divine words of our maker, and the clear, clear teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. Crystal clear. If you have any doubt, go back to the Quran, go back to the Sunnah. And let me tell you one thing though. I understand and I know why people at times end up doing all these things. Because I put myself in their shoes. Like say for example, if your wife is affected, or if your dear child is affected, if your son is affected, if your daughter is affected, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. At that point, you really don't care. You don't care where you go, you don't care what you do, you just want your child to be cured. You want your wife to be cured. And that's why many of us, we end up trying to take the shortcuts. But remember, the shortcuts lead you nowhere. Ruqya, spiritual healing, is based on the divine words of your maker. And that's the permanent, long-lasting solution. Don't take the shortcuts because the shortcuts will result in more destruction, more problems, more issues. Because at the end of the day, you're succumbing to that which is wrong. And one more important point, don't believe in people who say that they have the jinn at their command, at their beck and command. This is something that is wrong. Because according to our deen, we cannot subjugate the jinn. The jinn were only subjugated by Allah for Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam. Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam. No one else can subjugate the jinn. The only way they can subjugate the jinn is by striking a deal with the jinn. And that is generally a barter with the devil. You have to sell your soul to make sure that the jinn does what you want to do. These days there are people who claim to do surgeries using the jinn. There are people who claim to tell you different things and maybe, you know, tell you about your medical situation and perhaps how you are and what not using the jinn. These are all things contrary to the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. There are good jinnath, there are evil jinnath. The good jinnath, you can make friends with them in the sense they will come and perhaps at times become friendly, but they're never ever going to subjugate themselves to you because just as how the righteous of us are busy preparing for the hereafter, the righteous of the jinn are also busy preparing for the hereafter. And they're also busy pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is on the other hand, the evil ones, the mischievous ones, who want to cause mischief and go around causing different kinds of evils and whatnot, they're the ones who come and try to strike deals and say, you know what, I'll make you the richest person. I'll get you millions from the World Bank if you want to. I'll do this, I'll do that. They give you fancy dreams and at the end of the day, they strike a barter, a deal with you. They will make sure that you do all kinds of wrong things, all kinds of evil atrocities, all kinds of najis and all matters related to shirk associating partners unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So please, I implore you all, stay away from such individuals. Go back to the scholars who stick to the Quran and the Sunnah. If you have any doubts, if you need to clarify, go back to the scholars who are steadfast upon the Quran and the Sunnah. Just as how, when you want to ascertain a certain medical issue, you go to a doctor that you trust. You go to a doctor who you trust. Why? Because you feel that this person is a specialist in this particular field. I should go to him and I should take his advice. Likewise, in terms of spiritual matters, if you need clarification, if you need to sort out certain things, go to people who are specialists in that field. Specialists who you know who are upon the Quran and the Sunnah, who stick to the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And insha'Allah Ta'ala, Allah Azza wa Jal will open ways for you because you're not going on paths that lead to evil and destruction. It, it is a trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sicknesses are trials and uh, ch challenges from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the end of the day, we all go through it. It is upon us to be positive and not to lose hope, not to give in to stress, not to, not to give in to depression. This is what Islam teaches us. Stick, stay, stay on to all of this and keep your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most definitely, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on your side, you have nothing at all to worry about. With that, I conclude. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of our sins, to accept our good deeds. And my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, please say ameen. Just as how he unites us here for this event, may he unite us in the gardens of Jannah with our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. May Allah and his angels love you. Ameen wa akhir da'wai and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakum la khair. Donate now. Go to thedailyreminder.org slash donate.